Well, welcome back. You've done a great job. Super proud of you going through the composition of matter, uh, its classification based on not only phases of matter, but also its uh, chemical composition. So we understand with much greater detail what the term mixture actually means, a blend of many things, each retaining its own identity. And we understand air is a homogeneous mixture, a uniform blend of many different gases. And those gases would include nitrogen gas, Gas, which is in its molecular form a diatomic molecule N2. In other words, N bonded in a triple bond to N, and we'll understand a little bit more about that in future lessons, but kind of throwing that in. Nitrogen gas is the major component of air. Oxygen gas is also a diatomic molecule. Oxygen, we'll soon learn, is a double bonded molecule. I'm drawing little electron pairs, if you were wondering. We'll get to this lesson with Lewis dots. Argon gas is a noble gas, so it's not bonded to anything. So argon, an element built of just atoms, is written as AR, its atomic symbol. And carbon dioxide gas, hear that prefix, carbon dioxide. And of course, water vapor. All of these are components of air, and air is blended uniformly to create a homogeneous mixture. All of these in their natural state are colorless gas, invisible to the eye. It's if there is presence of pollutants that we would start to see visible evidence of air. And of course, because it's uniformly blended all throughout, we know it to be a homogeneous mixture. That composition we call air is a very thin mixture that separates us from outer space. And of course, even though it says it is a homogeneous mixture, its composition could be quite variable depending on pair on on where you are. So of course, there's less oxygen in a stuffy room, perhaps more pollutants in an industrialized or urban area. So the composition may vary, but whatever the components are, they are always blended uniformly together. What might some sapling practice problems look like depending upon the um, composition of air. We know that homogeneous mixtures have uniform properties throughout. What we're trying to say is that true or false. Homogeneous mixtures have uniform properties throughout. We know that homogeneous mixtures are blended uniformly. I can't walk to the side of this room and, and get in more carbon dioxide with a breath and go to the opposite side of the room and breathe in more oxygen. They're always blended uniformly. Pure substances contain only one type of substance and nothing else. Pure substances are indeed one type of substance. That substance can either be an element or a compound, but indeed that is a true statement with the very definition of substance meaning pure. Heterogeneous mixtures contain more than one part and each part retain its own identity. And that also is true. It's a uniform blend, but I can actually see the differences in the mixture. Components of homogeneous mixtures are visibly distinct. Oh, there we go. Homo means the same. It would look uniform throughout, not distinct throughout. So that is a false statement. And the last one, of course, the components of a homogeneous and heterogeneous cannot be separated. Well, you know from our lesson just in the previous folder that that's a false statement. The very definition of a mixture says they can be physically separated by physical processes, such as evaporation, filtering, distillation, all of those processes that can take a homogeneous or heterogeneous mixture and break them apart. So let's take a quick peek at that composition of air. Its major component, 78% molecular nitrogen. So in a bar graph we can very clearly see, or in the pie chart, that it is the most abundant gas in nature. We have oxygen coming in at 21%. And then, of course, other gases, all of those other components make up less than 1%. So remember this part here? We had about 78% nitrogen, oxygen about 21%. These are what they're calling 
all other gases, even the pollutants that we'll soon learn, like uh, ozone or sulfur dioxide, nitrous oxide, all of those other pollutants that come out of industrial waste, still make up less than 1% of the overall composition. So the vast majority is nitrogen. Interesting is we simply breathe in oxygen and it just exhales chemically unchanged. So we breathe it in and we breathe it right back out. When we breathe in air, we're breathing in primarily nitrogen. It's supposed to be a percent sign. 78% nitrogen, 21% oxygen. What does that term percent mean? If you have 78%, we know that that means 78 parts out of 100 parts are nitrogen. 78 parts nitrogen out of the total parts of 100. The very definition for nitrogen, parts out of 100 parts. Since nitrogen is the most abundant substance in the air, we refer to it as 78% in composition molecular nitrogen. We breathe it in and we breathe it right back out chemically unchanged. Even though oxygen is less abundant, <clears throat> excuse me, it does play a key role in our planet, obviously to sustain life. It's absorbed into our blood. It reacts with food to create energy. Remember this reaction from your biology days? This is blood sugar known as glucose. C6H12O6 is a chemical called glucose, just blood sugar. It becomes oxidized in our blood, right? We breathe in molecular oxygen. We exhale carbon dioxide and water vapor. And in doing so, we release chemical energy. This is what we'll learn is an exothermic reaction, heat releasing, exothermic. So this energy, if, if you remember biology, we called it ATP, energy molecules, not important here, just kind of reminding us perhaps of a, a different lesson. And we'll also remind ourselves in this chapter what it means to be a chemically balanced equation. We have a lesson on balancing equations where the number of C's, H's, and O's on the left and the right of our equation have to be indeed exactly the same. So when we count to balance equation, the left side, we have six carbons. And when I placed that coefficient of a six, I did so to balance the carbons. There were 12 hydrogens on the left. So when I balanced by placing a six in front of the water, I did so to balance the hydrogens. And when I put a six in front of the oxygen, there's six times two is 12 plus six more from the glucose, giving me 18. And I bet we've done that 12 times two, or sorry, six times two is 12, and six more is 18. This pattern here of balancing equations is a lesson in this chapter. It's just a little bit further on. So I'm just kind of seeding that lesson right here. This is also known as a combustion reaction, which also comes out in this chapter, taking a fuel, a hydrocarbon fuel. A hydrocarbon is a substance built of hydrogens and carbons. They are typically known as fuels. Well, what fuels our body are sugars, known as glucose. Notice this, this is a hydrocarbon. To combust means to burn, to release energy. We oxidize our fuel by adding oxygen, by breathing in oxygen. We're actually forcing the glucose to decompose and release carbon dioxide. <sighs> There's some, right? When you breathe out, out goes the excess CO2 and water vapor, releasing all the energy that was stored in those chemical bonds. So absorption into our blood necessary to create energy, and we just referred to this with a whole new lesson of, of uh, oxidation, adding oxygen. When we combust a fuel, we release energy, and we practice balancing all skills that will come out as we proceed through our chapter. Oxygen is also necessary for processes of burning and rusting. Oxygen is the most abundant element in our human body. And this is actually one of your sapling questions. Oxygen is the most abundant element on Earth. It's present in many rocks and minerals. 
The most abundant element in the Earth's crust is oxygen. Again, a sapling homework question. But oxygen is a non-metal. And you also are asked in your sapling question, just kind of seeding so you have a little reference to go back to, aluminum is the metal that's the most abundant element in the Earth's crust. So we will learn that there are two divisions on our periodic table in terms of categories of elements. We have metals to the left on our periodic table, and we have nonmetals that reside on the right side. Again, a future lesson in which we'll really dive into the periodic table and look for those trends. Every time we exhale, we put carbon dioxide into the air through that process of respiration. We wrote this a moment ago. When food is metabolized, we take the sugar known as glucose and we oxidize that. What that means is simply we add oxygen, forcing burning or releasing the energy that's stored in the chemical bonds. We exhale the carbon dioxide and some water vapor, but we release chemical energy, which is then forced to do work to sustain our life. And we even talked about that balanced equation, the 1666 coefficient ratio to balance the equation. So this is again something we just practiced in the previous slide and we're able to repeat to emphasize. Argon is a component of air and argon is inert. Inert means that it does not react. Argon or inert means lazy, which it means unreactive. All of the noble gases who live in group 8A on our periodic table, the last column on our periodic table, group 8A, are known as the noble gases. They are highly unreactive. So again, we breathe it in and we breathe the same thing right out. No metabolism of argon. So when we inhale and exhale air, just to remind ourselves what's in a breath, nitrogen, 78% in and out, not used chemically. Oxygen, we breathe in 21%, but we exhale 16%. This is used in metabolic processes of burning sugars to release fuel. Argon, 0.9%, breathe it in, breathe it right back out. You can see the same quantity, so this is not undergoing any chemical change. But look what happened to carbon dioxide. CO2, we breathe in 0.04, we breathe out 4%. We make carbon dioxide, so we make it through that metabolic process of burning fuels from inhaled oxygen. And water vapor is just said to be variable. It depends upon the weather. It depends upon where you live. Are you living in a humid climate or in a desert climate where it's quite dry and so forth. Even the weather patterns changes the, the moisture in the air from day to day. What's el what else is in a breath? Well, many forms of matter are present at concentrations less than 1% or less than one part in 100 parts. Carbon dioxide, we mentioned, was you know very small amount. We rounded on the previous slide to say 0.04%. It was measured to be 0.0393% in the year 2012. But we also understand, due to global warming and the release of carbon dioxide, it's slowly rising with every time we burn a fossil fuel, turn on your car, or the industry that's burning coal is releasing carbon dioxide. What might be a better unit to report such a tiny number in? I mean, if we only have 0.0393 parts in every 100 part, that's not even one. It's hardly contributing. So we'll have a better unit to report such tiny numbers. And the unit is known as parts per million and even a part per billion. This slide talks about parts per million. It is a unit of concentration that's 10,000 times smaller than 1%. Point zero nine three percent means point zero nine three parts in a hundred parts 
it means 0.393 in a thousand parts. See how we slid the decimal? 0.0393 in a hundred parts. Well, it's 0.393 in a thousand. Point, or excuse me, 3.93 in every 10,000 parts. See, 39.3 in every 100,000 parts and 393 in a million. We would call that 393 parts per million. Look what we've done. From expressing it as a percent to expressing it as a part per million, we've moved the decimal places four spots to make it a larger number. Very important trick here. To go from a hundred to a million, how many different zeros are there? Well, can you see to eliminate these moves it one, two, three, four more zeros. So that's why we move it four places to make it a larger number. The difference between a hundred and a million are four zeros. So if I look at point zero three nine three percent, I go one, two, three, four spots to the right and my O three nine three becomes three hundred ninety three parts per million. To convert between percent and parts per million, move the decimal four places to the right. To move between percent and a billion, well let's consider that. Here's 100. Parts per billion, and billion is 10 to the ninth. This is the term billion. It's a big number. Nine zeros. Remember a million was six zeros. So when we moved from percent to parts per million, how many zeros did we have? We had one, two, three, four zeros difference between a hundred and a million. We made it four spots to the right, four zeros bigger. Move the decimal four spots to the right. But what about a billion? Again, we had two zeros from a hundred, so let's eliminate these two zeros. How many zeros do we have remaining that one, two, three, four, five, six, seven? To go from a percent to a part per billion, we're going to move the decimal seven spots to the right to make it bigger. So these are pretty tiny numbers, aren't they? One part in a billion part. One e negative nine would be that representative value. Let's take a look at a homework question. The maximum contaminant level of barium in drinking water is set by the Environmental Protection Agency to be point zero zero two grams per liter. Point zero zero two grams per liter. That's what the EPA recommends the concentration of barium to not exceed. Assume the density of this solution is one gram per mil. Start by converting the grams per liter of solution to grams per gram using the density of the solution. And what we want to do is figure out parts per million. I think I forgot to just ask the actual question sampling was asking. Convert that into parts per million. So here's what we're saying. 0 0.002 grams in every liter a liter is a thousand milliliters. And we're going to practice the metric system in a future lesson here and just maybe even the next folder. But the metric system milli, we'll soon learn milli means a thousand. So you need a thousand milliliters to equal one base unit of a liter. All right, the term milli. 
milli is a smaller unit, so it takes more of them to equal the bigger unit known as a liter. And perhaps a milliliter sounds familiar. And it's telling us that there is, you know, the grams, uh, the density there, same thing, grams is the same as a milliliter. So what we're just really saying here is it's the same as writing. I have 0 0.002 grams in a thousand gram sample. So we're just really allowed to change the volume into a mass unit since the density is one. One gram is the same as one mil. So what does this come out to be so far? We have 0 0.002 grams in a thousand grams. How many would we have in a million grams? Right? So this is million parts per million. Well, a thousand is three zeros and a million is six zeros. How many zeros difference do we have? So the first three zeros from a thousand I can get rid of and the difference is three more zeros. So to move from parts per thousand parts, that's what we have so far, we have parts of barium in the total parts of the sample, parts per total parts, and what I really want to do is end up with parts per million. What was this, what is this new value? So I'm going to have to move this value one, two, three spots. One, two, three. It's two grams in a million grams, or we call that two parts per million. We said that the three zeros that are different from the, the magnitude of 1,000 to the number, the magnitude of a million, there's three zeros different. So I'm going to move my decimal three spots to the right. To make that number bigger, we have two parts per million as the suggested maximum level of barium in drinking water. The FDA recommends that women who are pregnant avoid eating more than three six-ounce servings of bluefish per month because of the relatively high mercury levels in that type of fish. If bluefish contain 0.328 parts per million of mercury, that means that there's 0.328 ounces of mercury in a million parts of the fish. You know, that would be ounces of fish. How many ounces of mercury would a pregnant woman consume in a month if she ate the maximum recommended amount of bluefish? Well, if six ounces of bluefish per month is relatively high because of the mercury contaminant. So if they eat one fish, bluefish, 0.328 ounces of mercury in a million 328 ounces of mercury per million ounces of fish. I'm saying that's the total amount of fish that you'd have to consume here. How many ounces of mercury would a pregnant woman consume if she ate the maximum recommended? So if she eats six ounces of fish, notice the ounces of fish are going to cancel. And she would do that by eating three servings. So let's get this value and then we'll say that that's going to be per serving. But she's going to eat three servings overall. Alrighty. So on our calculator, if 0.328 ounces of mercury divided by a million. So one, zero, 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 zero. That's one million. And if I were to hit equal, it would be quite a tiny number. But I'm going to multiply that by six. That's because she's eating six ounces in every one serving. And then I'm going to multiply it by three because she's going to eat three 
servings to re, to get that value. Here is the value my screen says. She's going to have 5.904 times 10 to the negative 6. In other words, 5.9 parts per million of the mercury. You should process that question. A woman eats fish and she's pregnant. How much should, how much is she going to intake? So 5.9 parts per million if she has 3 servings of bluefish and this each serving is 6 ounces and she's ingesting 0.328 parts per million each time. Great work. Good practices. Let's take a peek at one more. Suppose you have a bucket of sand containing 6.5 billion grains of sand. The total amount, 6.5. If the concentration of brown sand is 8%, how many grains of brown sand are in the bucket? So we have 8%. That's 8 parts out of 100 parts times that total quantity of 6.5 billion. And I'm going to write billion as being 10 raised to the ninth power. And that, again, scientific notation, we're practicing that this, uh, this unit as well, but it's 1 with 9 zeros after it. That's a billion. So when I write billion, I can write that in scientific notation by going 10 raised to the ninth power. That literally means 9 zeros. 8%, 8 parts out of 100 parts times 6.5 billion. Hit it with me so we're being sure that we have no calculator errors. 8 divided by 100 times 6.5, and then you have to use your scientific notation key and raise that to the ninth power. My scientific notation key is an EE. -E. I'm using a TI-84, a TI-30 still uses the same thing, but a Texas instrument uses an EE -E key for that scientific notation. I know that if you're using a Casio, Casio literally has a 10 raised to the X button as your scientific notation, but get familiar with the type of calculator you're using. When we hit that, it came out to be a big number. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 zeros after 52. So my screen went 52, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. 520 million is our answer, and that's grains of brown sand. 8% of a very large number. So what would that be in scientific notation? Again, seeding this next lesson. Here's where the original decimal is. We'd move it 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 positions to get to the first non-zero digit. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 eight positions left. Scientific notation would be 5.2 times 10 to the eighth power of brown sand. And we have the same process here. If the concentration of brown sand is eight parts per million, how many brown sand is how many grains of brown sand are in there? So the only difference now is eight parts per million represents eight parts in every million parts times the original value of 6.5 times 10 to the ninth, 6.5 billion. 8 divided by 1 million times 6.5 billion. Make sure you're hitting that with me and get very comfortable hitting for such large numbers. 520,000 grains of brown sand. And there's one last you're asked to do on your sapling. It gives you eight parts per billion. And I think instead of writing nine zeros, I'm just going to write that as one times 10 to the ninth. This would be one times 10 squared. 
This would be 1 times 10 to the 6th. We have 100, we have a million, and now we have a billion. And I'm going to multiply that by the number of grains of sand in the bucket, which was 6.5 billion. 8 divided by 1 billion times 6.5 billion, and we get the answer. Oops, I hit that wrong. I'm sorry. 2 is what I hit first. Two, it says 8 divided by 1 billion. I had a calculator error. Times 6.5 billion, and we get 52. That makes sense. This was great practice in reminding us what percent means, part over 100, what parts per million means, parts in a million parts, and what parts per billion means, parts in a billion parts. And we found the number of brown grains of sand in a bucket from a percentage, a part per million, and a part per billion. I'm going to skip this because it was a process loop for in-class lecture. You'd need a teammate for that. These concentration terms, parts per hundred, which we know to be a percent, parts per million, which is out of a million parts, and parts per billion, which is out of a billion parts, are the lessons that we just practiced with these previous examples. How many parts out of a hundred? How many parts out of a million? How many parts out of a billion? We've done great work at practicing what that means. If we see 21 percent, 21 percent is 21 parts out of a hundred. It's 210 out of a thousand. See? Because we're adding a zero. It's 2,100 parts out of 10,000. It's 21, whoops, I need another zero, out of 100,000, 21,000 parts out of 100,000, and 210,000 in parts per million. We moved this, if this is where the zero was to begin with, we moved it one, two, three, four spots over and made the number 210,000 parts. When I look at 100, Compared to a million, there are four zeros difference. We moved the decimal from 21. We moved it four spots to make it larger. We just did that problem. We're going to conclude our second lesson here. And the next part is all about the metric system. I'm going to ask that you stop the video here go into the next folder and complete all of the instruction on the metric system. I need you to come back to the environmental lessons when you've done a really good job practicing, converting, and kind of working towards understanding what each of the common metric systems represent. What magnitude of the power of 10 do we see? And how do we convert from one unit to the other? So again, stop the lesson here, go into the next folder on the metric system, and come back to these lessons when ready.